get started, I guess. Um, all right. So, um, so this chapter in, um, you know, it basically talks about obviously teacher engineering and uh, we typically want to understand what this means um, and you know I pretty much as the word says we are trying to we, we do this as a process or uh, we, what we're trying to do is from you know from from the point we get the raw data we want to be able to use as much information that is available from the data into be to be able to put into uh, some useful way into the model so for example um, I want to begin with, you know, talk about certain examples and maybe discuss that um, as a group. So there are things that you you would uh, you, you would get as part of the data, but it may not at the face of it may be very useful. So for example, if I'm looking at, um, you know, for um, for for a business, you're looking at users when like the date of purchase, right, and then you have what they bought and things uh, and more more things related to that. But just the, you know, having that date and putting that into your model may not serve the purpose well, but if you used it to create something out of that variable. So for example, um, what was the first date of purchase of this user? And, you know, if you compare it with today or a certain point in time, uh, when, when you're doing the analysis, you would look at what is the age of this user or how long has this user been buying? Um, if I wanted to look at, for example, how many times uh, each user has bought, so you would want to do a count of how many purchase dates you have for each, corresponding to each user. So that frequency gives you a sense of how loyal this customer is or, you know, how many times this person is coming back. And again, depending on the type of product we're looking at, uh, we may have few or, you know, many more, um, uh, what do you call the re, re uh, like the, the, the user might be coming back uh, multiple times. Um, for uh, purchases, uh, for making the purchases. So um, again, going forward, just to sort of define in simple words what feature engineering is, it is a process of uh, creating uh, new meaningful uh, factors or features um, using what you have in the raw data to make more sense for the model. It may also mean reformatting your predictive variables, values, meaning, uh, you know, this is, uh, to me refers to uh, as a process of dummy, creating dummy variables or dummification process where, um, for example, I have seen in retail, there are certain products who, which have a very high significant um, seasonality. Now, in order to, so there are different ways of you, how you can handle seasonality, one of which is um, that you probably want to create dummy variables for each month that the purchase is happening. And um, that kind of brings up uh, a lot of value in, you know, when certain products are sold in, you know, during the year, part of the year and, and not in through the entire uh, cycle. Uh, feature engineering as, as a process, it includes, but is not limited to, uh, you know, any transformations of your data variable or, or your fields. Uh, again, encoding could be, uh, in terms of how you want to re, uh, encode or recode your variables, transformations would include uh, if your uh, if, if the variable is not uh, normal trans, you know normal it does not have a normal distribution. You might want to look at uh, log transforming it um, to make it more useful. Um, and I think that has been seen a lot in uh, variables like income uh, because you know they they tend to be very skewed variables and or uh, it, it transforming them uh, to get a normal distribution is really helpful. Uh, and we'll, we'll also look at a data where, uh, in, you know, it, it's a scenario where we have transformation that helps. Now, um, it, it is also helpful in a situation where your, your predictors are highly correlated. Uh, you can then uh, do feature engineering to, to sort of do feature extraction. Um, and uh, we'll probably talk about this later. So in, in to formally define as, um, to formally give a definition, uh, feature engineering is, is a process of adjusting and reworking your predictors to enable the models to better uncover the predictor and outcome relationship. Um, and this comes from Max Kuhn's uh, separate book on feature engineering. Um, I can go on or should I pause if there's a question? Okay, I guess I'll go keep going. Um, 
so now that we've understood what feature engineering is, uh, I, I guess that what we can clearly see what are the benefits of feature engineering. It really helps us, uh, you know, get, first of all, create very meaningful variables uh, from the existing data, you know, in, in more reasonable ways that could get into the model. In, and in the process, we can see that if there are correlations between predictors, they can really be reduced and this helps us in the, you know, in feature extraction or removal of some predictors because if there are um, if there are fields which are you know kind of uh, correlated which are which are highly correlated and you can create something which is more appropriate uh, you know maybe related to these uh, variables or has has used these uh, correlated variables into a formula so if you can account for all the measures of um, the used uh, available variables and then you don't want to then use all you know three or four variables that you've used um, that, so one that you've created and then the others that you have used to create it. So you can then, you know, remove them. So you're basically, you're also in a way doing feature selection in this process. Um, in certain cases, if you have missing values, um, they can be imputed using the sub model and, you know, they can be extracted uh, based on um, uh, using the uh, engineered feature. Um, then another benefit of this process is that, you know, models that use a variance type measure, they, they can benefit from coercing the distribution. So, uh, in other words, I think, um, when, when we talked about transformation, so if there's a skewed uh, distribution variable, uh, you can, uh, you know, transform it into, uh, a distribution which has less variance and, um, and hence it, it's, uh, it's more reliable in that sense. Um, so yeah, I think uh, in this case, I, I have uh, talked, so I brought up this one example that was given in the book, and then I, I gave a few examples of my own. And I think this is a good place where probably we can all talk about, um, you know, the kind of work that have, we have been doing. And maybe if you want more ideas about, uh, you know, the data that your, your data looks like and what features you might be able to generate using that, or, you know, maybe talk about what you've been doing so that maybe others can gain some experience out of it. So, um, so as a, as a process of feature engineering, you know, it, it is basically part of a uh, pre-processing of your data when, uh, when you're getting your data set ready to, um, to be thrown into a model. Now, what are some of the examples? So as the book mentions, so if you want to create, so you have two different variables. If you, uh, want to create a ratio of those two predictor variables, um, within the data set that are rather more useful than the two variables individually, um, you know, that, that ratio would be um, one, one of those uh, new, one, would be a new feature. Um, and I am thinking of it as, I don't know, sales to profit ratio or, or something similar. Um, so some of the examples that I have personally used when, um, so I have mostly retail and financial services um, experience excuse me, in one of the financial services project that uh, we were working on for um, uh, fund management company, we were working on a logistic regression where we, we were able to, um, you create new features where we thought, you know, because again, the number of products that people buy were very limited. So we, we looked at how many times people are buying products and we also looked at how many unique products they're buying to be able to look at their behavior or their tendency towards how likely they are to buy in future. Um, so that basically, you know, is giving you a sense of how the consumer is going to behave. Um, and uh, now I think after having said that, I am happy to see if people want to share um, any of their examples. Example of a uh, feature engineer, is that how? Yeah, like any, any, um, any of the features that you have created in, in your work. Uh, you know, and that was probably more useful than what was already there. Like, for example, I mentioned the, maybe the age of uh, the user uh, considering when they first purchased or, you know, when, when they became, for example, if it's app, you know, when they became the member to as of today or something similar to that. Uh, I have a really boring example. Um, you guys know the Titanic data set? Mm -hmm. um, right, the survival and everything. So there, one of the columns there is your number of family members. So you might have like three other members boarding with you. And mm -hmm. one of the things that uh, I think Kaggle data scientists did 
was took that value. And if you have zero family members and you have zero like child, you can't, you get the classification of like a, I don't know, widowed or something. Maybe yeah, you don't have any. Yeah. So when they did cool stuff with it. Yeah. Yeah. And I think um, with respect to Kaggle, I think I've seen that uh, uh, the better feature engineering you can do, the better, you know, models tend to be. And, and I guess another thing is the more ensembling you do, the better, the more accurate you, your models end up being, uh, at least with, with Kaggle competitions. Um, Torin, you had an example to share? Yeah, something that I do a lot is like uh, principle, like dimension reduction in space, mm -hmm. like spatial data. So basically, yeah, just PCA. Um, they, they call it in spatial temporal, it's empirical orthogonal functions, but it's the same as PCA. Um, and then a couple, a thing that I have been using more often recently is um, there's a lot of like diurnal patterns in projects that I work on. So we just use like a cosine and sine transformation of time to have like a smooth um, functions to represent diurnal effects rather than I'm not like a huge fan of, you know, indicators before noon is day and night, you know, mm -hmm. those are kind of arbitrary. So yeah, I've been using it, the smooth okay. and transformation. And that's, so anything that, uh, had, that, that better represents um, the, the problem that you're working on? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Sounds good, cool. Um, uh, Indigo, you want to share something? Uh, yeah, actually, I worked in similar fields, so not only retail, but, but e-commerce and predicting uh, purchases and also predicting whether people interact with marketing emails. Mm -hmm. So I think that that similar one thing. So so we focused on using, using uh, linear models only, so their like, feature engineering was was re relatively important and with with time i think that might be interesting is that it 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 it, 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 it was useful to have features like you mentioned indicator variables for all months but what we did was was like for the for the past months we split, split it up by weeks so like the the last week's week's mm -hmm. activity was was really important but then the when when we went to the past we took longer intervals so like we did, did, didn't want to have like 100 features for each week mm -hmm. but we did like last week maybe the months before and maybe six months before and, and so on so so we found that like the most recent activity is the most most indicative of, of, of what you will do yeah. But then we also didn't want to just drop the other other activities. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. And um, so what you were mentioning also reminded me of you know in the similar project. Then we also looked at uh, email activities, and we, we we just looked at how many um, how many people responded to like how many people opened the emails, clicked on it, and then responded to it. So uh, again, email with, with respect to actual buying behavior wasn't as, as significant, but it was you know, still a, a slight indicator of, like better indicator of the, rather than not having it at all. So it still shows your interest that, okay, especially you know, the, the further you go into the, uh, the, the funnel that, okay, opening probably many people would do it, not everybody is still gonna be interested, but those who opened it, who, those who clicked on the link and then who actually read the link, you know, so the third uh, set of funnel is is definitely um, indicator of people who are interested in buying probably now or in future. They they could be time lag, but then that that's definitely um, a positive um, thing to look at. Okay, so I think those were some uh, good examples that we all uh, have have seen in our uh, practical day to day. So moving forward, um, so and by the way. Um, uh, uh, the, the credit of all of this, I have to you know give to Chris Martin, who was supposed to present, and uh, Pavitra, who presented from the first cohort. So I have mixed up deck from both of them. <laughs> so
so i i sort you know sort of uh, wanted to focus more on the content and you know sort of examples and how to disc- have have more of discussion instead of just presenting so yeah this part i think is from chris's um thing um and then i sort of mixed up some of the, some of the ideas of mine and um kind of okay going forward so um so chris suggested and i really like this so he said let's talk about this from uh the culinary analogy and uh, and, and very validly so because we we are talking about the recipes package in in this chapter specifically um so this um whole process of um getting the data to the point of modeling is uh is you know in in a way designed as a recipe the package is also called recipe um and so let's uh, let's try and understand how it works so it's a three step process where you basically write a recipe then you prepare your ingredients and then you actually cook the food um and the, the function names are also based off of this um you know thought process uh, so when you're writing a recipe it's only uh, it's only that you know you're you're specifying what you want to do you're not actually doing anything so you're you're just defining how the model should look like and you know this is the data that it is going to take and and things like that um but again like i said so you're not when when you run this like for example that function it is only getting things ready it says okay you you have given me instructions then when you call the next function of uh, call prep or prepare that's when you uh, you know based on the training data set you you start estimating the parameters and uh, you you get um, all the uh, you know model model details and then when you cook then you are applying the recipe on uh, you know training or the test data so Okay, you can probably see the function recipe functions here on the right. So that's 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 basically um, all that goes in here. Um, so going back to this code uh, uh, from the from the aims aims, I think that's the right way to say it. So this is what we are doing. Um, so when we create the recipe, we are just giving it the formula, and here uh, by giving the formula, we can. we are in, uh, inherently defining what my outcome variable is going to be so sales price is, in this case is the um uh the outcome variable then uh, these are uh, rest of the uh, other fields are what we are using uh, these are all the predictors that we are separating by a plus sign a very similar to you know how if you have used lm um, that's how it looks like and then you mention what data you want to use it on uh it allows you to you know uh, perform a lot, uh, series of steps which are basically for pre processing um so step log function and i think um, there is there is a appendix which gives you a whole list of what all functions can be used um so so step log basically is allowing you to do a log transformation as i was saying and um i think we we've discussed this in previous chapters of how the distribution of all these uh, different variables for this uh, data set look like so um i have avoided you know putting all those visuals um so if we if, if so this space uh, specifically this field uh, about the living area um is uh, is is skewed and hence we want to uh, look at the log transformation of this um then we can uh, uh, we can do uh, other sort of transformations and then dummification using uh, step dummy and all normal predictors is again another function that it provides by uh, it helps you just take all the um, categorical variables or nominal variables and you know if you want to do it like if you want to dummify one specific variable you can you know obviously put that or if you want to do it on all um, this allows you this basically will pick up everything from this data and uh, help uh, create the dummy variables for all of them so like i was saying earlier it could be for all the uh, month variables for all the purchases or we could look at um something like uh, this this neighborhood variable which is uh you know in in terms of uh, whether this is um uh what do you call um it's in the school zone it's is in the good school zone or yes or no something like that or you could look at um is this close to the you know uh, iowa university state university yes or no or um how far is it maybe distance wise buckets if you want to create that um and then um step interact it is uh, this is basically to account for interaction effects um i have deliberately not talked about in the presentation a lot about the interactions 
um but i had some notes from the other presenter i can i'll probably add if there is interest but i i mean i as a person i'm not i wasn't sure if i'm I, i'll be able to do justice to that topic but i'll probably skim through it if there is time um and then i guess that's about it so this is how um, we would we would define a recipe and then we would so this this piece is that we're mentioning what the pre processing steps we want to do on um, on on certain fields so again it, we don't have to do all the preparation before we don't have to prepare all the data sets um prior sorry that was my neighbor <laughs> doing his yard work all right so moving forward so hey, um, yeah, like question, i said i think looked at the data set but quickly looking at a subset of it to to start working on an example um so skimming the data uh, set sorry priyanka uh, jivan had a question sorry, sorry. Um, just a quick question for me. Yeah. Um, have you guys used juice before instead of bake? I no. Okay, I think it's just uh, uh, same thing as bake with new data and all. Uh, that's my understanding. Uh, okay. I've used it once, but I think I've used it once after bake to get back the data after it's you've done everything to it. I think that's like you you bake it and then you know then I think you actually pull the data set with like all the features and stuff changed to it. That's my understanding yeah. about juice. Um, I had a question on if you, can you go back one slide? Sure. In those steps, I know the order matters to some degree, but how specific does the order have to be in like the series of steps? Cause I know like obviously log, if you use, you're gonna log and if you wanna reference that log later on, but exactly. like that's what I was for saying. the other, for the other steps, how important is it? Um, I mean, I, I don't know if I have the right answer, but my sense is as long as the, your your variables are independent of like, if you're not using the log uh, living area variable for something else, right? It doesn't matter, right? Because as long as we are, we are doing three different things on three different variables, they're not dependent on each other, right? So if you want to do first before the second or third before the first one, I don't think the order should matter. I mean, that's my understanding. I don't know if anyone has maybe done it and seen issues with it. I think you are right. If they are independent, then it shouldn't matter. There's I just posted a link to an, to an article that, that they suggest the general, ge general approach mm -hmm. to be on the safe side, I guess. So... Yeah, I think you gotta really watch out when you're using uh, things like all nominal predictors, because uh, you implicitly ex uh, exclude out the uh, outcome. So if you if you were to use just all nominal, it would include the predictors, or sorry, uh, the response. So it gets messed up when you rerun it. Yeah, that makes sense. So especially with all those categorical variables, if you want to specifically work on one of them, and then if you've already done this, then you will that that particular variable won't exist. So yeah, that's fair. Yeah, I think even with this one, then uh, makes sense. Okay. Uh, any other questions? All right. So I guess this is the quick data summary. We I'm sure we all kind of know about it. Um, looking at the distribution of sale price, nice and beautiful. So now what do we want to do? Um, so like I was saying, so this is only a subset of um, the AIMS data set with, with a few variables, but again, you know, more for our um, demo purposes, we want to see how we want to go ahead, like what should the approach be? So we want to set the seed. So because, you know, when, are, when we are pulling um, this, um, when you're doing the sampling, um, you, you want to be able to reproduce your results. Um, then so initial split function would help uh, doing the stamp. Uh, yeah, we are, we are uh, basically splitting our data into test and training. Um, and yeah, I mean, simple, very explanatory um, function names. Um, only thing I think worth highlighting here is that this is, this is a, a stratified sample based on sales price and um, so again, the neighborhood 
um, is uh, is a qualitative variable that we're looking at here with, with lots of values. Uh, the general living area is a continuous variable, which um, we, we talked about earlier, we have not transformed. Uh, year built, again, um, we could probably also look at looking at the age of um, the house instead of the year built. Um, but uh, for now, we're just continuing with this uh, building type, which has five le five levels or five um, possible values. Um, now, this is one th which we could uh, use for, I think we, this is the one we use for dummification. So, and, you know, I'll, I'll also have an example of how the dummy would look like. Uh, I think somebody had a question. Uh, so, um, okay, so resampling was uh, something that came in between, but I guess I I don't see a lot of explanation that I need to do because it's coming up in chapter 10, so I'm sort of skipping through that. Um, so, yeah, so uh, before we actually talk about how things would be done in recipe, um, I just wanted to sort of bring parallel to it using LM because I think for me, I have done, uh, I, I'm more comfortable, let's say, with parallel or uh, with LM function, or I've done it more before because I've not used recipe, of course. <laughs> so um, it's it's pretty similar in that sense. Like I was mentioning earlier, you you define your formula uh, and you uh, start with, you know, you, you have your data set, you, you start with the formula of what your outcome variable is, what are your predictors. Um, and this is that how that formula looks like. So when you run this LM function, you store it in an object, then you you do a summary function on that object to give you the results um, of you know how that model ran. It also starts with saying, okay, these this is the uh, this is the formula that was used, and then how the predictors look like. What are your param so for for uh, linear regression? What were your uh, parameter estimates, p values, r square, and whatnot. Um, so just to draw that analogy, you can do the same thing, replace the formula name, the function name with the recipe, and then um, just go ahead and also mention the pre-processing steps that you need to do. And if you look at that, uh, you know, how that uh, resultant um, object looks like, um, it shows here that this is the input I'm using the, and again, it kind of clearly defines what, um, what role each uh, variable is um exhibiting um so how i have one outcome variable i have four predictor variables what are the operations that we are doing in our recipe uh, or what are the you know steps that we're taking uh, in in our recipe is we are doing a log transformation on this specific field we are creating dummy variables for all the nominals again if we had this one specific variable here that's what it would show and it, this is all it shows because like i said you know it is still just defining the process of what we're going to do. It, it doesn't have any summary, it doesn't have some results of what P value or R square is because it hasn't done that yet. Um, so I guess I've just talked about, talked through this. Um, maybe I'll pause for a few seconds and see if there are further questions on this. No, I think you're good. Okay, thank you. All right, so now that the recipe has been set, let's prepare. So we'll use the prep function, uh, mention what data you want to train, you know, like we, we've done this, uh, we created this when, when we uh, use the initial split. So we have the training data set, we have the test data set um, that we pulled out from, um, uh, from the, uh, what is the process called? <laughs> split sampling. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and then um, so this now when when I look at this object, what it shows me is again um, the role. Uh, it gives me a little bit about the data, um, and then uh, I think like I was saying earlier. So in in the prep, it is telling you what what all variables. I think this is only a different thing that we've seen from before. So now it has picked up which nominal variables it it is uh, taking to uh, you know. Uh, dummify it. Now, I think it, it's important here is because I have at least uh, had many challenges where you sometimes you assume that this is how your data uh, or your fields are going to be like this data type, but you know it ends up actually being, for example, something supposed to be a factor or it's supposed to be a categorical variable, but 
it is considered as numeric for for obvious reasons that you know um for example i was looking at um for for hypothetical example let's say a, a flag variable which is which has values 1 to 5 and you know there is a high high chance that when you're reading that data r, r takes it as an integer or uh, you know maybe co considers it as a double and treats it as a uh, more of a numeric variable rather than um, uh, a nominal here and hence it will not be included so now when you look at this and you're like oh why did the flag variable not come in i would want a flag uh, or dummies for you know one to five or sorry two to five or one to four dummy um for that as well so this would be a step where we basically figure that out or you know helps debugging in that sense um now with, with this data now you can look at how many rows i have this is what it is showing um, you could also, uh, you know, read it in more tidy way using the tidy function. Um, and I guess that should be it about this. Um, this is a log, step log, step dummy on the train data, which is true. Um, so this is logical character. I guess that should be uh -huh. good. Yeah. Do you know about so why you would use this tidy function? I didn't really get it. So I get that it it gives you a nice data frame, but why would you be interested? In what you just defined yourself? So why why do you want that? That's a good question. Not that I have answer to that. Uh, I guess I'll check with uh, the other guys and uh, come back to you. Well, maybe ask it on the group. So maybe somebody else has answer. I think um, 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 when you're doing a PCA, I think doing a tidy is important because you extract the principal components, if I remember correctly, when you tidy the, uh, the whole thing. Okay. All right. And um, so I uh, think I wanted to bring this up because I, I saw this in earlier discussion. So uh, I think Edgar, you had mentioned earlier about uh, you know keeping your original data. So I think that retain is equal to true is one of those options that lets you, uh, you know, bring back your original data if you, uh, so if what, what this really means is you, you know, you, though you're doing your prep, uh, it probably um, is not going to overwrite on your uh, original data. I hope that makes sense. I don't think it's about the original data. I think it's about keeping the the prepared training data in memory. Like like you don't wanna do the same calculations again and again, but but keep the prepared data with the recipe at least. On the help page, it's keeping the pre-processed training data in the so in that simple aim. I think it would have a slot that has the data before it was. Yeah, so I, no, I think that's that's why I believe I tend to call it original data. Uh, yeah, maybe then, then I misunderstood it. I, I thought preprocess means that you you you, you apply the preprocessing steps. Yeah, right. so I think. Uh, well, I think applying the steps then means it's post process. Yeah, correct. So yeah, th that those are basically the processing steps. So if you want to go back to your uh, steps, you know, go back to the original um, columns where you did not apply the steps. I think that's what it means to retain them. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think I think if you scroll down, I think it shows. No, it doesn't. Um, but yeah, I think you guys are right. I think. It asks the question is, is should the pre process data set be saved into temp template slot of the recipe after training? So I think it does it and then it saves it into the into simple aims. And I think that's like similar. Yeah, so I think that's what it is. I think it's asking you, do you want me to save this? And you say true or false. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wait, if you don't save it, can you not bake it? You can, but I don't think. You then have to do it in the baking process, I think. So like this, and it, it, the documentation says like you do it just in case you want to add more steps later on. 
Yeah, and I think I I personally see it more for I mean more useful for debugging purposes. I mean that's that's how I tend to do things. Um, but I'm not sure if there's anything else also mentioned in the um, documentation. Should I move on? Let's bake. <laughs> All right, let's get baking. So now we have written the recipe. We have um, we have uh, you know prepared our ingredients. So all that we need to do is just throw it and bake. Um, so again, you mentioned uh, now you know we have created the model with the training data. Let's throw in the test data and see um, how it applies to it. Um, so again, you, when you've created that object, you can look at what you have. And so, yeah, so I mean, simply, you know, it, 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 that sense, it's really running that function, I feel like is, is very minimum job that you have to do as long as you understand what's going on under the hood. Um, that's really the fun part of it. And yeah, I think it's worth asking that question of, why you want to use tidy because it's been used here as well. So I guess that's about it. Like, you know, so now if I, I already have, uh, so this is uh, giving me the new table with 35 records. With the, I think test data set was this big based on, so these are the original variables. This is the sale price and neighbor is the dummy variable. How many columns do we have? 13, 25 more rows and three more variables, skewing kurtosis and standard error. So yeah, I think we have these many because 29, uh, neighborhood had 29 values and um, there was another one with five. Uh, let's see, which one was that variable? Uh, building type, I think. Uh, it was the, like the values were townhouse. I thought um, I had gotten that thing here. Yeah, so it was this um, type of family, like what kind of house it is. So it is one family house, two family condo, duplex, townhouse, and I'm not sure townhouse E is or extended something. So when you are dummifying that variable, what comes out of it is you get N minus one. Um, so one variable has N values, right? So in this case, it has five values. So what you get as an output of uh, dummification process is you get N minus one, so four in this case, and you get, uh, you know, like, so for any value that, so, so if this variable had value of two family condo, so this uh, dummy variable will be one for this, all the rows that have this value and then everything else will be zero. And then similarly, uh, you know, all other values will be one and zero based on that. And when you have all these dummy variables as zero, that indicates the nth value uh, that you're representing. So um, in, in this context, what it, I think it does is it usually dummifies it uh, like by default with the first value that it observes. Um, but there are there are ways that you can change it if if needed. But I just wanted to bring this up from the uh, for the example. So um, again, I think this is just a sort of display showing the twenty nine values that neighborhood variable has. Um, from the count perspective. So we can uh, also reduce it by, you know, by looking at some threshold and say, you know, I don't want to look at all values. We can make that change. Um, so collapsing some of those, uh, this is what I'm talking about, collapsing factor levels for neighborhood based on that threshold. So 1% uh, would all be, um, anything less than 1% would, you know, would be combined into, so something similar to forecasts when you want to say, you know, lump, uh, FCT lump, when you, you 
bring up uh, all and then based on a threshold you say uh, lump everything into other uh, i i see this uh, piece as like that um what else so i guess maybe I'll, i should pause here and see if there's questions okay good all right so i guess um combining it all together uh, let's see so aims data said we have several uh, predictors to estimate the property size um some of them are like they correlated in which we can do dimension reduction so um so we are looking at the same um you know recipe method but if you wanted to do um, some feature extraction out of that let's look at um we can add that pca step here as well and okay um yes um I lost my chain of thought. What's I going to mention here? So, if you want, I guess you can mention how many um, PC, how many components you want. This is only showing me one. Okay, I. Well, that's just a step, right? Number six step. Yeah. yeah. So we are doing. We are. Uh, you know. We are all. We can also do this as a step of pre-processing that we can uh, do the uh, dimension reduction in in within the process. Like that. That, that pre-processing can be done. Um, but I'm just thinking. Um, what What I was trying to show here, I think, is the minimum number. Like that. How many uh, components you want? But I'm not sure why this. I don't think one. that. I think that the step PCA has an has an argument num com like no, number of components. So in the step function, you can. I think by default it will have the same number of components as variables. Okay. And you can have fewer if you want. Sure. Right. Okay. Um, yeah, I think for this. Um, but this option, I think I'll have to double check and come back. It uh, just refers to the that that it's the sixth step in in the pipeline. So when you tidy, you specify okay. which which step do you want to tidy. Okay. And okay. it's the sixth step in the pipeline, so it it has nothing to do with the number of principal components. Okay. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So okay. So this is basically, um, I think, just an additional step. We are showing that uh, we could we could do further uh, feature extraction or dimension using dimension reduction in this case. Um, also, in just one one line of code here using this uh, function. Um, so basically, how how are the how are data being used by the recipe? So we um, think so. This is again just sort of bringing. Oh, sorry, my mouse moved on. So we are. Um, how are we using the data? It's basically, uh, you know, just bringing up the functions that we've used. We we prepared the recipe, we prep the data, and then we bake it. So we when we are prepare when we're writing the recipe, we want to use our entire data. I think that's the the biggest um, takeaway here. Because remember, we when our, we're doing all the pre-processing steps, we want to do that on the entire data. Because uh, you know how it is identifying the nominal variables and um, all the you know identifying all the data types of the col of all the columns that we have in the data. I think it's important to use it uh, uh, use the entire data to to be able to create all those. And specifically, um, I think it, it makes more sense because I I have at least uh, personally gone through a lot of those challenges where you if you do this on the training data. Your modeling uh, or you know the prediction step will fail if it encounters new data from the test data set. So and it happens a lot with with categorical variables. Um, I think uh, going back to the Titanic example, probably um, if you have uh, let's say a categorical variable which which can take five or six values, but in your training data set for some reason your sample you know the the samples that you picked up your training data only had four of them. So if you 
you know, in, as your as your test data set, if you pass that fifth value, it would break saying, you know, I've never seen this value before, so I don't know what to what to make out of it. So that's why it's it's important to use the entire data while you're doing the recipe, so that all the pre-processing, you know, all that dummy, for example, those dummy steps if they need to be created, they would um, be used uh, in in the entire modeling process. But of course, when you when you start to uh, um, do the uh, actual, um, you know, prepping of the data only when you're making the changes to, to the training data set, then you only want to do those changes to what is available in the training data set. That is what is going to build my model. Now, when you bake it, when you are, uh, when the model has been prepared, so the predictions are really only needed on the test data or on the new data. So at this point, you're not re-estimating um, and hence you, just want to uh, use what has been uh, what has been created as you know as your methodology. Use that. Um, so I think in terms of regression, the equation has been created in in the second step. Now you just want to use that equation to uh, to be able to predict uh, the final results. Uh, does that sound good? Yeah, good call on the uh, categorical variables. Like when I use uh, step other and step dummy on the same time on uh, categorical variables, like it doesn't pick up sometimes when you're seeing some new categories in the testing set. So, cool. All right. So, uh, again, uh, so uh, I think pretty much just be what we talked about. Um, you know, going through it um, in the core example. So this, uh, when you when you prep the final aims recipe, you can, you, I mean, you start with the prep function, then we bake it um, and we say, so similarly, I can use the same thing and say, okay, uh, like again, sort of drawing parallel. Uh, you want to look at okay this glance is a new function i am used to using summary function for uh, you know looking at the object this again is is more of tidy uh, version of it um and then when you start looking at what your um uh, uh the summary object or the model output looks like this is how it gives you the values and then you can use this object to, you can use it in the predict function to um, prepare the, the values. So, um, you know, same thing when you um, send in, you either send in the test data set into the bake by using the, the last prepped um, object. Um, and then here you are using LM and predict function in, in the previous versions of, um, uh, Go, like existing codes and uh, the models. Um, this doesn't give me the values here. So we, I guess I can't compare the actual values, but um, primarily these numbers are derived using these estimates and these, um, this, the previous um, predictors. And what else? And I guess that's it. I did manage to do it in time. Yeah. <laughs> Yay. So that's about it. Um, Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, any any impending questions? Oh, thank you, Torin, for the clap. <laughs> Uh, yeah, any any additional questions? Any uh, maybe even more discussion on of your examples? Would you consider uh, feature engineering as part of data pre-processing? I I personally think so. Yeah, because um, you and and I say that because you know it's for me or the way I have worked on past few projects is. You know, until you are actually ready to model anything that you're doing uh, from the step of initial visualizing to trying to make sure that everything is good to go in the model, that's all pre-processing. Um, so making things more useful for the model is, yes, it's, it's all, um, it's a, a pre-processing step. 
और जीवन सेंटर लिंक और ब्लॉक पोस्ट एम पी सी है ओके आई I I think it. So uh, one one other viewpoint might be that for different models you might need different feature engineering or different feature engineering might make sense. So for me, probably you have some things that you will do with every type of model, maybe taking the log transformation or creating dummy variables, but others such as. Uh, normalizing numeric variables right. are only needed by some specific types of models. So then it's, for me, it's more part of the modeling because it, it depends on which which type of model you use. Oh, yeah, that's true. And I think, in fact, the book had an appendix link where it mentions where you want to, uh, there are few models where you would need to do the normalizing and centering versus others. Uh, so yeah. In fact, I think that's, um, if, if we still have time, probably we can talk a little bit about how you um, approach normalizing, because I, I don't do a lot of those pieces, but I think I want to understand, like, what are those, like, what and how of uh, how you do the centering and normalizing of um, data? Or what are some scenarios, I think, to begin with, where you need to do that? Some models have, like, scale-dependent like lasso, right, and ridge regression. The tuning parameter it, for shrinkage it is scale dependent on your predictors. Mm -hmm. So if you center and scale everything before, um, it's easier if, like for me, I do, I had to do like a grid search, like I didn't use the cross validation tuning. I did it like outside but I was having problems because I wasn't centering and scaling everything. Um, right. So um, I think I, if I I don't get those technical terms so much uh, well, but I think I, I understand that scaling issue is, so if my predictors are something like age and income, you know, mm -hmm. so income is running into hundred thousands and then age is obviously an, anything, you know, between two digits, two digit numbers. Mm -hmm. So if I'm using these two in, in, in these kind of models like ridge and lasso, uh, income would always have a higher impact because it, it is on a larger number scale. Um, and, and so I understand the need of it, but I guess next step is, um, how do you do that? So uh, one, you said centering. So are you, when, or, or when you say normalize, are you saying that everything we bring it between zero and one, like in both the cases? No, no it just means you subtract the mean sample oh, mean okay. and divide by the sample standard deviation yeah okay so everything is approximately like zero mean zero standard deviation oh, okay. One. okay okay gotcha so and then centering uh, is centering and se normalizing same thing or is it different centering is only subtracting the mean and normalizing is subtracting the mean and dividing by the oh, standard deviation okay. Thank you. There's a step normalize if you don't want to deal with it. That does open <laughs> yeah. for you. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, and do you have a link for that? I thought you oh, said send something. That's very helpful. Thanks, Torin. Because I like always not too clear on what is normalizing and how is it, how is it different from centering. Without mixing it up. Yeah, and then you get your like random forest, right? Where you don't have to do anything before you feed anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but is that true? Var variable importance affected by the scale of a variable? Oh, does I don't it? Know. In I'm random sure. forest, I, um, it might depend on. I I think I've read somewhere that in uh, in the decision trees, it does not matter so much. Yeah, in the building the model, but you know, you can like look at those variable importance metrics. Mm -hmm. I don't know if those are scale, like sensitive to scale. Yeah, when I just realized there's also something called standardization and I this is back from my um, uh, SAS days. Uh, so I think there we used to, so when you mentioned you on the step normalized, there is, there is also standardized function in SAS that used to do, I think the same thing. Um, uh, 
wonder if it, I mean, with IDAR, is that the same? So standardize also is same as normalizing and like meaning centering and then dividing by standard deviation? I personally would say that they mean the same thing, yeah. Okay. And outside of, I don't actually really ever use, like I'm in this book club because I've never used any of these packages. So when I do that normalizing, I just use the scale function in R. Okay. Yeah. Wait, what kind of things do you use if you don't use piece packages in R? I just go to, I mean, I use <laughs> like the tidy verse, but I've never used tidy models. I just use the base. Like everything it, else. She, she works a lot on spatial, so I'm sure she yeah. does those things she works on, like maps and stuff. Is there like an ecosystem there? Like we have it, you know, tidy models in spatial? There are some big spatial packages like um, SF is like a big one. Mm -hmm. I think I've only um, used that to make maps, to be honest. No, I yeah. used Leaflet for maps once. <laughs> yeah. I could just go show off. I can do <laughs> Well, there's like, GG map. Yeah. Use that. So I think there is one uh, Google Wiz. I, I used it for something long back. Yeah. Uh, the Google thing has changed recently, though, and how they like authorize it. It's gotten harder to actually yeah. use Google Maps in R, I think. Okay. It might have changed. Well, it might have been updated, okay. but like two years mm -hmm. or a year and a half ago, it was like something just changed and 